All right, so I'm Elena Vucic. I will be presenting this paper to you today. The... Sorry, it seems like, yeah. Uh, the Smart Body Sensor Network for Logging of Activities of Daily Living. This was done as a subject of a master thesis by uh, my colleague Igor Vordelia and I, with the help of our professors from the School of Electrical Engineering from the University of Belgrade. So in the presentation, I will uh, go over the, um, the introduction, introduce you to the problem we're trying to solve, the method. I will show, uh, I will, um, show you the system architecture and uh, uh, the implementation of the actual applications. Afterwards, I'll show you what the applications look like and what features it offers through a use case scenario. And I'll also describe how the system was validated and the achieved results. And I'll close with a short recap, a comparison with existing solutions and a bit about potential future improvements. So to start, uh, generally we have assistive and neuroprosthetic devices that are designed to alleviate motor impairments of upper limbs uh, in a clip. And these are usually evaluated in a clinical setting or a research laboratory. So this can bias the results since performance gains observed in control conditions do not necessarily transfer to activities of daily living. And it is crucial to have objective and quantified evaluation uh, of these activities to, in order to be able to design effective rehabilitation therapy or assistive solutions. And to this goal, uh, we're, the design of practically applicable and reliable activity monitoring systems is critical. And during the last few years, an increasing trend can be spotted in the usage of wearable technologies for human activity monitoring. And the architecture of such systems typically includes different biometric sensors, a microcontroller, and a protocol for wireless data transfer to the computer. Uh, the smart devices with a variety of powerful sensors have enabled the growth of these wireless sensor network solutions for tracking and recognizing human activities. However, the currently available measurement systems uh, for at-home daily activity monitoring are either too complicated, unreliable, or tedious to be used for an average user. And in this paper, we propose a novel, easy-to-use open source sensor logger, or SL for short, software framework for long-term activity tracking utilizing Android smartphone and smartwatch sensors. Uh, so the framework establishes real-time uh, wireless communication between all connected Android devices and acquires cross-sensor data from them. And the smartphone acts as a central hub that records the acquired data and controls the actual logger behavior. So to show how the architecture actually looks like, we have uh, uh, this slide. So you can see that the system includes, so for one, uh, the system that we've, we've used, but it can be expanded further. So two Wear OS smartwatches that subjects carry on the, the wrists. They include the developed mobile application for the data acquisition from smartwatch sensors. And they collect data, including three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope, three axis magnetometer, the step count and uh, the heart rate of the user wearing the smartwatches. Uh, let's say the central hub is the Android smartphone with the developed mobile application. And it's, uh, it uh, receives the data via Bluetooth and stores it. Also, it acquires geolocation data from the actual phone itself and logs the activity diary entries from the user. So these are, um, let's say, this is additional information about the performed activities that the user provides uh, to give them more context so that when the researchers actually see the information, they can uh, connect it to the activities performed. And finally, there's an option. Um, we have a desktop device with a developed application for quick data review, data storage, and data export. So when the mobile device connects to the appropriate server on the desktop device, it can send the collected data for further processing for the researchers. It's important to note that the system architecture is scalable. And even though in the present study, uh, the sensor logger operates on two smartwatches, it theoretically supports an arbitrary number of them. So here we just have the data collected listed. We've already uh, gone over it. As for the challenges and the major requirements we had for building the system, we have first the GDPR. So due to the medical purpose of the project, 
and the uh, general data protection regulation or GDPR for short, uh, the system must preserve all data locally without sharing it with external services. Uh, the privacy concerns impose additional limitations when selecting the technical solutions. So for example, the existing solution for data storage and communication between phones and smartwatches, which relied on the cloud or uh, the Google Fit API was deemed to be unsuitable. So the, all the data is stored locally and the user has complete control over the data in the sense that uh, they can uh, delete it and they have control when the data is actually transferred to the, uh, to the researcher via the desktop application. So uh, we also have to account for uh, performance and scalability. So the system needs to support simultaneous connections with multiple devices, that is smartwatches, and it needs to be scalable. As a result, the system should not have a hard limit on the number of connected devices. And uh, however, a high number of connected devices will increase the memory and uh, communication load on the mobile application, thus limiting its performance. And that is, let's say, the, um, the limit of the system. So we had to also uh, make the system robust in order to preserve battery life. Newer versions of Android operating system will more aggressively put applications uh, in the background and eventually terminate them. So the mobile applications had to op operate, uh, optimize battery consumption to avoid being targeted by the Android operating system. And we had to account for the storage limitations because the system is envisioned to run for several weeks. The accumulated data could reach 10 or more gigabytes in the, uh, let's say, worst case scenario. And then we had to devise an efficient solution for data storage transfer and visualiz visualization needs. Um, as for the actual implementation details, so we have the mobile application, the desktop application. Mobile application was, uh, uh, was written for the Android and Wear OS uh, operating system in Java. Uh, the library used were, uh, were wearable API for the communication between phone and wearables provided by Google, Protobuf for serializing the data, and Google's HTTP client for actually sending the data to the desktop application. As for sensor data collection, the application subscribes to data updates from the relevant hardware sensors with a sampling rate specified by the user. So the applications do not have to be open and running because the data is collected by a service that runs continuously in the background. And to avoid Android's built-in battery memory optimization systems, they're tasked with terminating these memory or battery consuming processes. The service had to be a foreground service, which allows these things. Uh, the communication between the smartwatch and the, uh, smartphone, uh, the smartphone application is done using Bluetooth for low energy or BLE for short. BLE is intended to provide considerably reduced power consumption and cost while maintaining a similar communication range compared to classic Bluetooth. And for communication, applications use the wearable API as already mentioned for actually uh, transferring uh, the data between the wearable and uh, the smartwatch. Uh, the data size obtained by, um, by the application is considerable because it comes from multiple devices with multiple sensors that continuously generate new values and the connection, collection period spans uh, sometimes multiple days or weeks at a time. So since smartwatches come with little storage space uh, that cannot hold the amount of collected sensor data, only data caching is done on the wearable devices and the data is sent to the mobile application, which handles all the storage inside the, its database. And the sensor data is periodically internally serialized and compressed to reduce the space it occupies on internal storage. As for the desktop application, so the desktop application was intended for researchers and uh, it serves to transfer data collected by the uh, mobile applications and to visualize, validate, and export the data. Using the application, the user can import data directly from the smartphone or from local storage. Uh, they can export the data in three formats, SQLite, JSON, and CSV. They can execute SQL queries over the user's activity diary, and they can visualize data for smartwatch and smartphone sensors in the form of a dot plot and store it in PNG, JPEG, PDF, or SVG format. Uh, the desktop application was developed using web technologies, so uh, JavaScript, Node.js, HTML, CSS, and uh, most importantly, the Electron framework. The biggest advantage, the advantage of using this framework is that 
It supports creation of multi-platform executable files, so it can be run on both Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and can be easily ported to work as a web application if needed. As for the uh, implementation details, so data transfer from the smartphone, when the user chooses to transfer data from the smartphone, the desktop application enters the server mode. In this mode, the application selects a free port and address dynamically and starts up an HTTP server that waits to receive data from the mobile phone. The desktop application starts advertising via multicast messages uh, that contain the address and port of the server so the mobile application can actually find the server. And the server expects to receive the uh, sensor data files and metadata describing how many files uh, and the, let's say, identification of the files. Uh, the received binaries containing the data are decompressed using the ZLib inflation method. And once the data is decompressed, it goes through deserialization, uh, which is implemented using the protocol buffers, which is also used on the mobile side for serializing the data. Uh, and this is done using a proto schema that contains the serialization logic. So after deserialization, the data is stored inside an SQLite database on the desktop. As for the data conversion, generally modules that offer the ability to convert SQLite database to CSV and JSON format, try to load the entire database into RAM and then transfer data to a suitable format, which leads to failure because the average computer does not have enough RAM to handle the amount of the sensor data. So to avoid this issue, all conversions are handwritten and RAM consumption is limited at the expense of CPU time. Uh, when the user selects which data will be loaded or when the transfer of data from the mobile phone is completed, the data will be display, uh, displayed in the form of a table inside the desktop application. And drawing all the data from the table is very memory consuming. So this problem is solved by using paginations where the user can see only 30 rows of data at a time. And this saves the, uh, the process and, uh, and the memory. As for the data visual visualization, uh, there's an option through the menus that uh, the user, user can choose to visualize the data. And uh, since the amount of data after two weeks can be extremely large, it needs to be reduced and adjusted to draw on the graph. So to reduce the number of points uh, drawn on the graph, the data is divided into time intervals and only the minimum, maximum, and mean value points are taken from each interval and displayed. For the actual graph, the high trust module was used to draw the points, uh, it, which allows the user to select the sensors for uh, display, to select the length of the time interval, and to zoom the graph as well to, as to move around the graph itself. As for what the applications actually look like, so this is the mobile application. The app continually runs in the background, collecting the data from sensors, and the user can control the data by just clicking on the button. Uh, and he, he can see the status of the, of the data collection uh, in the application. The user also has a fab button, which you can uh, see here, that provides additional options like deleting uh, uh, collected data and sending the data to the server. The server can usually be found automatically or the user can manually enter the IP address and port if it can be found automatically. Uh, there are also um, a devices tab, which shows just the list of paired uh, devices that are collecting data and the journal tab, uh, which is a tab where you can see the list of activities. The users have the option to add new activities and by selecting an activity, uh, the user can preview actually the activity details and can delete or edit it. The smartphone application, on the other hand, uh, doesn't offer any controls. It only displays the status of the data collection because the system is controlled completely by the mobile application. Uh, the user interface is customized for people with upper extremity impairment. So the options are uh, that are often user highlighted, graphical components uh, are large and uniform color coding is used. Um, to present the features of the system, a use, case, a use case scenario was designed. One healthy volunteer was recruited to take part in the future testing and the subject wore two smartwatches, one on each wrist and carried the smartphone in her left pocket. So they were tasked with doing an activity sequence uh, that included sitting, normal walking, standing and shifting a box on the table and opening and closing 
the door, as well as taking a tr trip from Slavia Square to the IKEA Center. And here on the slide, you can see uh, the actually accelerometer signals from the left watch for uh, each axis as shown in the desktop application. So this would be the graph. This would be the whole use case scenario. And then we can see the, uh, let's say uh, zoomed in, just the activities of, for example, sitting or opening and closing the door. Uh, only the accelerometer data is selected, but other data can also be selected in the UI of the desktop application to be shown. As for the uh, geolocation data, so the, the subject was tasked to go from the Slavia Square to the IKEA Center and based on the uh, data points, uh, the longitude and latitude were extracted from the desktop application and then the coordinates were put inside the Google Maps and uh, therefore verified that uh, the, the coordinates were correct. To validate the system, two commercial inertial, inertial measurement units were used as a state-of-the-art reference system. The IMUs were attached to the subjects, one per arm, with the smartwatches right below them, and the sensor logo smartphone was in the pocket. Commercial software was used for the IMU data acquisition with a sampling rate of 100 hertz, and the sampling uh, frequency for the SL system was set to 30 hertz. Now, three healthy subjects uh, participated voluntarily in the experiment. Eight different activities were defined, so the, the movements were relatable, meaning that they were done in day-to-day -day life and that they were natural. So these uh, include sitting with crossed arms, uh, sitting and holding a cup in the right hand, then in the left hand, uh, sitting and grasping by right hand, followed by left hand, followed by both hands, and finally standing and opening the bottle by right hand and then left hand. So the uh, example of acquired accelerometer data only for the x-axis for the variations of grasping activities are presented on the slides. So we have here grasping by the left hand, then the right hand, and then grasping by both hands. And uh, you can already visually see the highest similarity of the time curves for the reference system and the SL smartwatch. But there, uh, we also use the dynamic time warping algorithm or DWT for short to uh, for the overall quantification of data similarities. So the values were calculated for all three subjects in all activity uh, in all eight activity scenarios. The table with the ex uh, exact values uh, you can see inside the actual paper it was too extensive to put uh, to be put on the slides but most of the values uh, besides one outlier uh, showed high similarity and the mean DT W value is 1.08, which suggests the high overall similarity between the reference and the SL time curves. Um, during the testing of the, the application, we've de detected uh, several issues. So it was noticed that a smartwatch's battery drains relatively quickly and that it's necessary to recharge them periodically. And uh, to resolve this, the size of the messages uh, is adapted to extend the operation time of the smartwatches. It's also been noticed that some packets may be lost in communication between the smartwatch and the smartphone, and the data is not collected with a precisely defined sampling rate uh, because uh, we are using a general purpose Android system and not a dedicated measuring device. To better uh, contextualize our contribution, we have compared the SL system to the existing approaches. For example, one paper, uh, the authors compared the contribution of an anatomical arm and myoelectric prosthesis to overall arm activity. They used the commercial activity monitor, which provided continuous logging of acceleration across three axes at 30 Hertz for seven days. But it logs much less data than our system, which in addition to track acceleration also records things such as angular velocity, geolocation, beats per minute and manual activity entries. And moreover, our solution is more practical because those users who already have an Android smartphone and a smartwatch only need to be equipped with an additional smartwatch. On the other hand, our system does not include any data post-processing or analysis tools. So it's up to the researchers to uh, process the raw data, raw data received by the applications. 
Uh, also, not all activity trackers used in research are commercial devices. Some of these are developed specifically for research purposes. For instance, in one paper, authors measured grass frequency and use it in daily household and machine shop tasks. In their study, four subjects wore the head-mounted camera for three to five days and recorded videos. The videos were then manually analyzed and labeled with a specific grasp type in order to calculate grasp frequency and durations of each grasp type. And although their initial results could lend a deeper understanding of how people use their hands in work-related activities, the system that they have developed is impractical for everyday use because it's bulky, because of the head-mounted camera. It generates a large amount of data that needs to be labeled manually. And it raises significant privacy concerns because the camera records not only what the user does, but everything in uh, their point of view. Uh, and the last paper I'll talk about is a paper used to classify user activities based on data collection from accelerometer and gyroscope in a smartphone attached to the waist, so a bit similar to ours. Experimental results have shown that a triaxial accelerometer can classify activities more accurately compared to a triaxial uh, gyroscope, and that both sensors combined contribute to better classification performance. But the described uh, system differs from the sensor logger in several aspects. Online classification works only with a small amount of data, which is not stored on the device, and it cannot be reused afterwards for any kind of research. Multiple devices are not supported, as it works only with mobile phones, and it can only recognize predefined activities. Um, in conclusion, the system we've uh, implemented is a software framework for logging the sensor data from Android-based smartwatches and smartphones. The recorded data is not processed anyway is in, and is stored in a raw format. The sheer amount of uh, data and variety of it is unprecedented, not available currently in a um, similar system as far as we know. This empowers researchers to investigate a wide variety of research questions since they are not anymore limited to use only the high level features typical of activity trackers like a step counter, for example. And uh, the system is scalable. It conforms to GDPR and it is intuitive to use. The system could be further improved in terms of reliability by reducing the number of lost packages. And it, the current co connectivity capabilities could be extended to support a wider variety of smartwatches or sport trackers that are compatible with the Android ecosystem, like for example, Fitbit. The user interface could also profit from integration of rudimentary data visualization tools and more comprehensive data management and notification system. Finally, the desktop application could be improved with additional tools, such as an option to automatically extract and export features from the data that are common in the context of machine learning applications or activity analysis. Um, with that, we've reached the end of the presentation. Thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Thank you very much, Elena, for your presentation. And we have uh, some, still some time for the questions. So do we have any? Before anyone else start, I would like to ask a question because at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, the problem may be the amount of data you need to store and you need to process. Uh, uh, can you give me some estimate how much data, let's say in, in the scenario that you showed us uh, was produced? Uh, I mean... Uh, yes, let me just check real quick. We actually put that information inside the paper itself. We did some estimation for the case of two weeks of data uh, with two watches. Mm -hmm. And I think that the estimation was somewhere around just a second. I mean, it could, um, as I said, I think in one part of the presentation, in the worst case scenario, it could go up to maybe 10 gigabytes. But the actual implementation, uh, the, uh, the actual Okay, that's okay. fine. It, it, it's just about the estimate whether we are talking yeah, yeah. about, I don't know, megabytes okay. per, per hour or, or more or something like this. Okay, uh, so at 30 hertz, I think for 10 hours, we generate approximately 130 megabytes of data with the two, two watches and the phone. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that you can connect to multiple devices and that all the devices are connected using uh, Bluetooth technology. 
And uh, have you tried to find a limit of this because the Bluetooth needs to, you know, the phone needs to connect all these devices and all these devices communicate with, uh, with the smartphone. So how much, how many devices can you connect to your smartphone? Have you tested this? Uh, we haven't tested it explicitly because uh, we didn't have that many devices mm -hmm. uh, at our disposal. But the theoretical limit right now is seven devices because of mm -hmm. some limitations uh, just put in by Android operating system. So okay. an Android phone can't connect to more than seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. Okay, perfect. Maybe just a short question. Um, maybe when a person is uh, not doing anything, uh, you don't have to store data. Did you consider this as an optimization? Uh, yeah, possibly. Yes, possibly. Uh, we could uh, possibly decrease the the amount of uh, data collected in in that manner. We would just need to have some sort of uh, let's say algorithm that says whether the uh, the person is actually standing still because of the small variations in data. But uh, one of our thoughts, but we had uh, haven't had the time to implement yeah, it yet. That, that's a trick from uh, audio and video codex. They don't uh, produce data when, when there's no speech or, or video. Thank you. Thank you.